Salam alaikum. You have to check this out. So in the Andrew Tate video that I did, I mentioned that the scientific miracles in the Quran were debunked. And for some odd reason, funnily enough, like as if they thought that it was a slip of the tongue. I'll repeat it again very carefully. The scientific miracles argument in the Quran got debunked. During the past couple of months, I have been uploading videos like the Prophet's time machine, the Prophet's secret space station, the Prophet's secret submarine, the Prophet's secret ultrasound machine, the Prophet's secret biology research center, the Prophet's physical miracles, and the linguistic miracle of the Quran. In this playlist, I have demonstrated more than 200 miracles and pieces of evidence that proves that Islam is the only truth from God. I noticed mainly two types of viewers. The first type watched the whole playlist fully and then texted me very, very nice, encouraging words. They told me that they really appreciated my effort and they told me that these videos changed their lives for the better. And they kept asking for more. But on the other side, the second type didn't even give it a chance. They immediately started attacking me and claiming that I'm presenting evidence that had been already refuted. And it would be a waste of their time for them to watch the whole playlist. I have no problem with someone saying that his time is too valuable to waste in learning Quran and Hadith, even though in reality he wastes hours and hours watching entertainment videos and playing video games. It is his life decisions, I don't care. The thing that I really have a problem with is people making claims about something that they didn't even watch. Or even worse, claiming that Allah didn't provide evidence for humanity. Or claiming that the evidence of Islam has been debunked. This is why I'm recording this video, to answer all of these claims publicly so everyone would benefit. Did Allah provide evidence for us or is he expecting us to have blind faith in him? How is it fair that some people witnessed Moses splitting the sea as evidence of God and we have to believe without witnessing any miracles? Are we making up these miracles in the Quran and Hadith? Are we changing the meaning of the Quran and pretending it fits with scientific discoveries? What about those articles online with titles like Refutation of Scientific Miracles of the Quran? Are these articles really refutations or lies? Did early scholars have the exact same understanding of the verses and the hadith the same way we are presenting it? Did other people in history also get lucky with their future predictions the same way the Prophet did? Are these considered lucky guesses or actual miracles? Are all miracles of the Quran videos real or are some of them made up? And what's the deal with this video of Ali Da'wa saying that scientific miracles in the Quran have been debunked? And why are Islamophobes celebrating it all over the internet? Are these pieces of evidence enough for us to believe in God or not? Do Muslims believe all these because they were raised to be Muslims? And would they have a different point of view otherwise? In this video, I will answer all of these questions and more. So bring your coffee and let's start. The first question is, is God expecting us to have blind faith in him? The answer is absolutely not, without a shadow of a doubt. The Quran is the only book on earth that urges its reader to use his intellect to find the truth, encourages the reader to ask more questions, challenges the reader to learn and research, even challenges the reader to imitate a chapter of it if he has doubt, challenges its reader to compare it to other claimed scriptures to see the difference between the words of God and the words of human. Allah himself said in Surah Fussalat, سنريهم آياتنا في الآفاق وفي أنفسهم حتى يتبين لهم أنه الحق. We will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes so clear to them that this Quran is the truth. So the question now is to the Muslims who are quoting the Islamophobes, repeating whatever they claim like parrots. Islamophobes are saying there are no miracles in the Quran when it talks about the universe and our biology. And they are skipping this verse in the Quran while they are reading it. I will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that this Quran is the truth. 
am I making the claim that there is proof in the Quran that it is the truth? Or is it Allah himself who is making the claim that there are signs and proof in the Quran to show that it is the truth? And take care that the verse is not talking about signs for the existence of God, like for example his creation. No, the verse specifies that those signs are to prove that the Quran itself is the truth. I would think about it twice before I repeat the claims of the disbelievers without passing it on my brain first. The idea of going to a scholar and asking him a question and he responds by saying, no, you shouldn't ask questions, you should just believe blindly. You can find that in other made-up religions, where preachers are mostly covering up a lot of the huge issues in their book from the audience. That is absolutely not acceptable in Islam. We say ask as much as you want, then ask more. Allah challenged every nation in their area of expertise. For example, ancient Egypt at the time of Pharaoh, they had expertise in magic. The magicians of Pharaoh had amazing abilities like making ropes and sticks look like they are moving to the eyes of the audience. What was the miracle of Moses again? Exactly. Moses, peace and blessing be upon him, challenged the magicians in their area of expertise and turned a stick into a real snake this time instead of just an illusion. That is in addition, of course, to other miracles. At the time of Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, people were boasting about their knowledge in healing and medicine. Jesus healed the blind and raised the dead by the will of Allah. See? in their area of expertise that they were boosting about. That is, of course, in addition to other miracles. And at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, Arabs were boosting about their superior ability to produce amazing poetry using one of the most complex languages on earth. Allah challenged them to produce a chapter like the Quran, that is, in their area of expertise. That, of course, in addition to other miracles. But wait, isn't the Quran for all generations until the Day of Judgment? Times have changed. We are not experts in poetry anymore. Instead, we are in the information age. We are experts in learning about the universe, learning about our own biology, learning about geology, learning about history through archaeological discoveries and other sciences. So the challenge in poetry is not relevant to us anymore. And you know what? You're right. This is what I was presenting over the whole playlist. The challenge also exists in the Quran for us. You can use archaeology to discover information about history that humanity had no idea about. Okay, read the Quran. You will find some of this information that you just discovered. When you make this discovery in the future, you will know that this Quran is from God. You can make discoveries about outer space. You can use your technology to see faraway stars, black holes, galaxies, and whatever. Perfect. Read the Quran. Here are some information about outer space that you have not discovered yet. When you discover them in the future, you will definitely know that this Quran is from the Creator. You can discover your own biology and finally learn about the human embryo, for example. Perfect. Here is an accurate description of the human embryo in every stage. When you discover it in the future, ask yourself, how did the author of this book 1400 years ago know exactly what the human embryo looks like in every stage? The same applies to geology, oceanology, zoology, botany, and other fields. سنريهم آياتنا في الآفاق وفي أنفسهم حتى يتبين لهم أنه الحق. I will show them my signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that this Quran is the truth. I will not repeat the 200 signs I presented over 6 hours of videos. I will leave a link to them in the description in case you missed them. The point I'm trying to emphasize is if I tell you to believe in God because thousands of years ago there was a man called Moses who split the sea in half that would not be fair. Because to the audience of that event, it was a miracle. But to you, it's just a bedtime story. You didn't really witness it, and it is fair if you say that I will not accept that 
as a proof. This is why it is crucial to watch these six hours of videos of non-stop signs that prove that Islam is the truth before you make any life decisions that you might regret later. Now let's talk about the part that all of you have been waiting for. Are the miracles of the Quran and the Hadith refuted or not? During the past couple of months, a lot of you have been sending me videos, PDFs, online articles. All of them have titles like The miracle of X has been refuted. The refutation to the miracle Y in the Quran. And so on. Whoever is making these articles are actually putting a lot of effort into them. So I decided to go through most of them. And this is what I found out. I divided these claimed refutations into three categories. Number one, real refutations. Number two, fake refutations. And number three, straight up lies. Let's go through each one of them, one by one. Number one, real refutations. They are usually when the author of the article does not accept the miracle of the Quran because the science related to this miracle is not established yet as a fact. It usually goes like that. The Quran claims this fact about outer space, for example. Modern science says the exact same thing. However, this is not yet established as a scientific fact, which means it is not 100% proven yet. It is probably only 90% correct, but not 100. Therefore, I don't accept this as a miracle. You know what? Fair enough. The author is correct, and I would ask him to skip this miracle altogether and check the other 200 I provided in the videos. Even if he claims that 10 or 15 of them are not 100% facts, you still have the remaining 185 miracles, right? And they will be enough for you to believe that the Quran is the truth. Number two is fake refutations. Those are articles with titles like the refutation of miracle X in the Quran. And then when you read the contents of the article itself, you find literally nothing. A lot of generated text that fills the page without any argument whatsoever. The author is literally saying, this miracle has been refuted because I don't like it. Or saying, this miracle has been refuted because I don't want to believe in God. This is not a refutation, bro. This is just your opinion. Others say something like it's not a fact because it has an exception. These people don't really understand that exceptions don't really nullify the fact. For example, if I make a statement like sports are good for your health, some idiot somewhere will come up and say, no, it is not a fact because there are some incidents where athletes get injuries while playing sports. Yes, brother, this is called the exception, which does not nullify the fact that sports are good for your health. They use the existence of exceptions to everything, to every fact in life, to induce doubt in the statements themselves. And they use the same methodology to induce doubt in the statements in the Quran and Hadith. This is just ignorance that I don't even have to waste my time responding to. So let's focus on number three, the straight up lies. This is the most important one and I want to take my time in it. Those are the articles written by Islamophobes. And we already know how these Islamophobes have no problem whatsoever lying day and night without hesitation. Those people fabricate lies about Sharia law, lies about jihad, lies about the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him, lies about the translation of Quran verses, lies about Hadith. So why wouldn't they fabricate lies about refutations of miracles of the Quran? For example, I talked directly to three of these Islamophobes in an online video call. This was the conversation between us. One of them said, Are you a Muslim? I said, Yes, Alhamdulillah. So he said, That means that you believe that the earth is flat and is spread over a giant whale, right? I said, What? Where did you get that from? They sent me a screenshot that was cut from an Arabic book that says, in the beginning there was Allah. He created the pen, then he created the whale, then he spread the flat earth on top of that whale, then he created us. They told me, see, this is proof. 
Every Muslim should believe in a big whale under the earth. I asked them, why is this screenshot cropped? Where is the rest of the page and what is this book? They said it is cropped because the rest of the page is irrelevant to our subject. And this is all what you need to read. And it is in Arabic, therefore it is authentic. So do you believe in a giant whale that is under the earth or are you not a Muslim? If you don't believe in a giant whale, you are a kafir. I was trying so hard to keep myself from laughing because I wanted them to bring out all what they have. I want to know what they are saying to young Muslims over the internet because this is very dangerous. If they say that to a young uneducated boy, he might just believe them. Especially because they have this weird cropped up image from a weird Arabic book as proof for their claim. Anyway, back to my conversation with them. I was lucky enough to have a copy of this Arabic book they were referring to. It is called Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya li Ibn Kathir. This quote was from the first chapter of the book. Let's read it together, but we read it fully this time. It was said that Allah created the pen, then created the whale, then spread the flat earth upon the giant whale. This was one of the false beliefs of some of the people of the book, and then Allah corrected this false belief in the Quran. See this last statement? This is the statement they purposely cropped out. So I asked them, why did you crop out the last part? Why did you crop out the part when he says that this is a false statement? One of them said to his friend, you know what, there is no point talking to this guy. Let's try with someone else. And then they left the call. Imagine how many boys and girls left or doubted their faith because of those liars. They are just spending their day online, calling random Muslims and trying the same trick on them. Imagine someone coming to you, claiming that he knows Arabic, lying to you on purpose, cropping out parts of the Salaf quotes to give them different meanings, then pressuring you to choose between believing his lie or calling you a kafir. And because his lie is so ridiculous, you might just choose to be kafir over believing in a giant whale under the earth. Go back to the Prophet's Space Agency video, go to chapter 10, Ball-Shaped Earth. You will find 10 references from Salaf scholars more than 1,000 years ago, saying that we learned from Quran that the earth is ball-shaped. Another example, regarding the gender of the bee miracle. They said in the refutation that in Arabic, if you want to refer to a bee without specifying its gender, you will still use the female verb anyway. Therefore, the whole miracle is refuted. What they purposely don't tell you is that in Arabic, if you want to refer to a spider, an kaboot, without specifying its gender, you will use the male verb. But the Quran purposely uses the female one for the spider too. That proves that the mentions of animals and insect genders in those verses are intentional. If they tell you that, it will not be a refutation anymore. Again, straight up lies. Another example. Regarding the mountains are stabilizer pigs miracle. They tell you there is a verse in the Bible that says Jonah's whale swam to the root of the mountain. See, the word mountain root is there. Therefore, the Quran is not the first book to mention this fact. The problem is the verse in the Bible refers to the mountain root swimming in unlimited water under the earth. This is how Jonah's whale reached it. The whale swam from the ocean to under the earth until it reached under the mountain. The word root simply means bottom. So what the Bible is saying is there is sea connected to the ocean under the mountain. The miracle in the Quran is that it refers to mountains as pigs or anchors. Their roots go very deep and have the function of pinning the surface of the earth from swaying. The miracle is not that mountains have roots swimming in unlimited water. The verse in the Quran is actually saying the exact opposite of what the Bible claims. As for a nail to hold something to the wall, this nail has to go deep into a solid surface. Go back to the Prophet's submarine video for more details about that. Another example. Regarding the same miracle, the mountains are stabilizer pigs miracle. 
I found another refutation. They tell you that there was a man called Kaab ibn Lu'ay. He wrote a piece of poetry in Arabia 50 years before the birth of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. It goes like that. وَعَلَمُوا لَيْلَ سَجْ وَنَهَارَ ضَاحْ وَالْأَرْضَ مِهَادْ وَالسَّمَاءَ بِنَاءْ وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادْ وَالنُّجُومَ أَعْلَامْ See, he says that mountains are pigs 50 years before the birth of Muhammad. So, the Quran was not the first book to mention that fact. Okay, good claim. But to accept it as a refutation, we have to authenticate the source. Let's go to the source itself. Let's ask the same people who narrated this story. Is it a correct story or not? According to Muawiyah ibn Salih, this person who narrated the story is known to be a liar who fabricates lies about Allah. According to Hashim ibn Martad al-Tabarani, he is a liar and cannot be trusted. According to al-Bukhari, he was a liar. According to Ibn Ma'in, he is known to steal speeches and attribute them to other people. According to Ibrahim ibn Ya'qub, people didn't trust him. According to Abu Zur'a, he was not trusted to narrate speeches. And according to Abu Ubaid al-Ajiri, this narrator is known to fabricate speeches that never happened every night. Those are the same people who narrated the story that you are quoting. They are narrating the story and they are saying it was a lie. If you don't like the testimony of Arab historians and scholars about the narrator, then why are you quoting from Arab historians in your alleged refutation? Either take all of their knowledge or leave all of their knowledge. You can't pick and choose whatever you want that shows your ill intentions. Why do you put all of this effort into deceiving? people. Brothers and sisters, you have to take care. They target two types of people. The people who are not well educated or don't have access to the Arabic language. And type two is the people who are looking for any escape, any escape from God because their desires overpower them and they don't want to follow the commandments anymore. So they would take any refutation even if it doesn't make any sense. Studies show that most people, when they check news or do research, they only read the titles or look at pictures. And they rarely take a look at the contents. If you find an article that says refutation to something, that doesn't mean that this something has been refuted. It just means that it is written in the title. You have to read the contents. Because reading the title only and taking it as a fact is the highway for ignorance and delusion. Allah said in Surah Al-Hujurat, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا O believers, if an evildoer brings you any news, verify it first. Please stop reading article titles without verifying their content. Are you saying that all online videos and articles claiming to present miracles in the Quran are real? Like, none of them are fake? Actually, no. In my research, I found a lot of fake stuff. And I really think these fake articles are kind of a Trojan horse strategy, where an Islamophobe first creates a fake miracle of the Quran video, and then later refutes it himself. That is to induce doubt in the real things. We spent more than six months, believe it or not, researching and collecting information to create the Evidence of Islam playlist that you can watch today. In our long research, we found more than 500 claimed miracles in the Quran. We divided them into the following categories. Number one, absolutely impressive, solid proof. Number two, somewhat impressive, but not 100%. Number three, Potentially impressive, but unfortunately, it cannot be proven yet. And finally, number four, ridiculous claims. We avoid the third and fourth categories completely, which is why we only have 200 miracles in our playlist and not 500. Also, you will find me differentiating between the first two categories when I'm talking. Sometimes you will find me saying something like, this is what the verse means, and it cannot be interpreted otherwise. And sometimes you will find me using words like, 
this might be the explanation or maybe this is what it means when you're watching the videos focus on the language that I use to present each point. And if you decide to ignore all the points that have 90% probability and stick only to the proven ones, fair enough, you will still have maybe 150 or more out of the 200 that will still be good enough for you or for any sincere person to find the truth about God. In most of the points presented in the Evidence of Islam playlist, you were presenting exactly the understanding of the Salaf. Except in some of them, you were adding some information that the Salaf did not say explicitly. That introduced some doubts in my heart towards these specific points. Okay, I, I like this feedback. Let's first clear something out. Am I claiming to have better understanding of the religion than the Salaf scholars? Of course not. Am I claiming to have better understanding of the Arabic language than the Salaf scholars? Again, of course not. They are our teachers. They understand the language and the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet much better than us. However, when it comes to science and future predictions, we cannot overwhelm them with what they cannot bear. For example, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said that in the future, the land under the Arabs will spit out its wealth which will make them rich and they will compete in building very tall buildings. If I say now that the earth under the Arabs spit out petroleum and that made the Arabs rich and they started in building very tall buildings, someone might say, but they didn't say the word petroleum. I can't find the exact word itself, petroleum, in the hadith. Yes, you are correct. He didn't use the word petroleum. But the word petroleum itself is a word that we just created lately. It is a word that we created and we added to the dictionary of the language that didn't exist before. We made it to refer to this black liquid that made wealth for the Arabs. So he cannot really use the word petroleum because the word itself didn't exist in the 7th century. We made it up later. So for him to use the word petroleum in the 7th century, it will mean nothing to the people of his time. It will not even be an Arabic language. And then maybe later, when we discover the black fuel, we might call it something else actually. We don't have to call it petroleum, we can call it benzene. Then you will tell me, I can't find the exact word benzene in the hadith. A lot of people are demanding the exact terminologies in modern dictionaries to be present in the 7th century language. You have to be smarter than that. Another example, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said about this time in the future that dishes will communicate. Now let's imagine that we went back in time and talked to Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir, how are you doing? How do you think in the future dishes will communicate? He will be super confused. He will be like, oh, I don't know. Maybe the food dishes will have mouth and ears and they will talk to each other. I have no idea. Don't get me wrong. He understands the religion, the Sharia law, the Arabic language, everything of that better than me. But this is talking about an event that will happen in the future to him. He has no idea how will it happen. Imagine that I take him with me in my time machine to the present day. And I walk with him in my street. And I show him that down the street there is this big sign that says, I am a technician and I install and fix your communication dishes. He will immediately ask me, what are those communication dishes? Because the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said that in the future, dishes will communicate. So again, let's be fair and differentiate between Salaf scholars explaining Aqidah, Sira, Sharia law, these fields of knowledge, and Salaf scholars explaining the exact way future predictions will happen. That is too much to ask from them. That also applies, by the way, to the translators. For the same specific reasons, you might find the differences between the translations of the Quran available online. Because these translations are not direct translations of the Quran itself. It is translations from the books of the Salaf. I give some examples about that in the miracles of the Quran videos. Check, for example, the Prophet's submarine, go to chapter 6, lowest place on earth.
that is not exclusive to your prophet. Other people had made predictions too, as they came true. For example, Joseph Smith. He predicted the American Civil War before it happened. Even outside of religions, some people made future predictions too, like the famous French future teller Nostradamus. Okay, that is a very good question. Let's start with Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism. He predicted the American Civil War before it happened, which means Mormonism is true. This statement looks like the type of statements I make, but there are two differences between them. Number one, if you read the complete prediction of Joseph Smith, he said that the fight between North and South America will result in an all-out war, a world war. That will include Great Britain and other nations too, and that never happened. He also prophesied that the end of the world and the coming of Jesus will be in his time, and that also never happened. The irony is that those Mormons claim to believe in the Bible, and they have this clear rule in Deuteronomy 18. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message that the Lord has not spoken. They ignore this rule and they still follow Joseph Smith for some reason. And they also ignore all the hundreds of accurate prophecies that were made by Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and came true. Subhanallah. Number two. Even if we assume that this prediction happened, who said that everyone who can make a correct prediction is a prophet? Making future predictions is like tossing a coin, heads or tails. If you make 1,000 future predictions, most probably you will get 500 of them correct and 500 incorrect, more or less. It is humanly impossible though to make all the 1,000 predictions and all of them come true. And listen to this, it is also humanly impossible to make 1,000 false predictions. Impossible because in order for you to make 1,000 false predictions, that requires you to know the correct ones. So if you open any prophecy book or any ancient science book, those people make thousands of claims. Aristotle, for example, he had a lot of good knowledge and a lot of correct theories. But he also said that worms grow up to be snakes. He also said that women has less teeth than men. He also said that semen clots period blood the same way rennet clots milk to form cheese. This is the cheese baby theory. Any ancient book that makes hundreds of claims about science or about the future will contain some correct predictions and a lot of false ones. The difference between all of these books and the Quran and Hadith is all the claims about the future and about nature and about science, all of them came to be true. Not only true, by the way, and impressively accurate. Not only that, some predictions were not a choice between black and white, heads or tails where you have 50% chance of being correct anyway. If I tell you in the 7th century, guess what the human embryo looks like in an ultrasound machine? You don't have a 50% chance to get it right. You basically have near zero chance of getting it right. You're not choosing between a black and white. Not only that, some of the predictions had deadlines. If you are a false prophet pretending to know the future, you would not be stupid to make a prediction that has a deadline. You will say some vague statement about something that will happen in the far, far, far away future because by the time they discover you were lying, you will be long gone. But no, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him predicted events that would happen within his lifetime. Some of them were things that would happen in the next day and some of them were things that would happen within the next few years of his life. If he was rolling a dice, why would he take this huge risk? Because the moment one of these predictions fail, his own followers would just execute him. And even if you are a non-Muslim, even if you don't believe he was a prophet, you will still agree with me that he was one of the smartest people on earth. Because according to you, he deceived billions of people. And you can't really deceive billions of people by being stupid. So why would one of the smartest people on earth take a stupid risk like that? No, no, sorry. Not one stupid risk, a lot of stupid risks in a row. And finally, 
for those math geeks or students of practical universities. Those people who have learned to calculate probability. Can you calculate for me the probability of tossing a coin 200 times and getting heads all the 200 times in a row without one being tails? And then regarding Nostradamus. I tried reading part of his book, The Complete Prophecies of Nostradamus. I couldn't really continue reading until the end because it was very hard for me to stop laughing. I will give you one or two examples and you will understand why was I laughing. Nostradamus predicted that in the future, a king will die and his kingdom will be destroyed. Then they say that prophecy happened when the Soviet Union collapsed. What? Nostradamus predicted that in the future, a fire will happen. That's it, a fire will happen. And buildings will be destroyed. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Then they say, this prophecy happened when the Twin Towers collapsed. And so on. Vague statements about events that normally happen anyway. And then they link it to any event later. Someday for sure a fire will happen, right? Someday for sure a king will die. It's like predicting that someday rain will fall from the sky. An event that would happen anyway without a deadline. Are you comparing that to the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him? For example, when the Persians and Romans were fighting, the Persians were winning most of the battles and they were conquering more and more land. Against all odds, the Prophet revealed verses to us that say the exact opposite of what everyone predicts. It says that Romans will make a comeback. And this comeback will happen in less than nine years. Focus on this. First, it's not anonymous. It's not saying someday a king will die. It is specific to the Romans. Second, it has a deadline. It says nine years. And these nine years are within the lifetime of the prophet himself. And that's a huge risk for someone that you already agree is very smart. Third of all, it is against all odds because everyone expected the opposite. That is the difference between a prophecy and a vague statement that can be applied to anyone or any event anytime. Like saying, someday, somewhere, there will be a big fire. Where is the prophecy? Please stop reading article titles. Read the contents. Because yes, the title of the book is called Prophecies, but there is no prophecies inside. Another example. In the middle of the battle of the trench, Muslims were very few in number and power and they were being surrounded by all the armies of the pagan Arabs together. They were getting ready to be deleted from history. The most optimistic of them was hoping that his kids will not be slaughtered with him. In the middle of all of that, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, you will triumph over the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. No, no, try to process what happened. A few hundred helpless men preparing themselves for the inevitable death by the pagan Arabs around them, while the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, is telling them that they will triumph over the biggest two superpowers of the world back then. Even claiming that they will triumph over the pagan Arabs is a stretch. And you know what? It happened and it happened within their lifetimes. I'm not talking about their children or grandchildren. The same people who were preparing for their death witnessed the opening of both superpowers. Are you comparing that to a man who prophesied that there will be a fire somewhere someday? Please stop reading articles and books titles. Read the contents. According to a lot of Muslims, the scientific miracles are not really miracles. None of them is to be considered 100% proof, therefore you cannot call them miracles. You know what? I will give it to you. I agree. Yes, I should not be calling them miracles. For any of them to be called a miracle on its own, it should be indisputable 100% proof. And none of them alone are. This is why you find a lot of people saying there are no miracles in the Quran. Or scientific miracles are not really miracles. Again, I agree. But if I stop talking now, this last sentence will be cut 
will be taken out of context and the Islamophobes will make an all-night celebration and will drink their victory toast. As if you listen to it out of context, it will seem like I am saying there is no proof of Islam and there is no proof of God. So instead, I will try to choose my words to demonstrate exactly what I mean instead of leaving it for the interpretation of the internet. I presented 200 pieces of evidence for Islam. If you take only one of them, only one, it will not be sufficient enough to prove Islam 100%. It will just make you wonder. Hmm, based on this point he presented, I am leaning 90% towards the validity of Islam, but not 100 though. Then you check the next one, and then you wonder. Mm, this one alone also made me lean 90% towards the validity of Islam, but not 100%. Each one of them is like that. None of them alone are 100%. It's never 100%. You can say to this, maybe this was a lucky guess, maybe the other one was a lucky guess, and so on. But what most of you forget to do is some simple math. The probability of getting lucky on something like describing the shape of the human embryo 1,400 years ago is what, 1%? You know what? Let's be super skeptical. Let's say 10%. Okay, then what is the probability of guessing two lucky guesses in a row? 10% multiplied by 10%. That is 1 over 10 multiplied by 1 over 10. That is equal to 1 over 100. Okay, then what is the probability of getting 200 lucky guesses in a row? That is 1 over 10 multiplied by 1 over 10 multiplied by 1 over 10 and so on 200 times. That gives us this number that I can't even read. This is humanly impossible. And that is a miracle. Anyone can make a lucky guess or two. But it is impossible for one man to make hundreds of claims about scientific facts and about the future and does not make one mistake in all of them. That is the miracle. But if you take only one or two, you can still debate whether it is proof enough or not. Even those people who induce doubt about everything and refuse to take half of them, they will redo the same calculation. 1 over 10 multiplied by 1 over 10 and so on, but this time it will be only 100 times instead of 200 because, you know, they reject the other half. The equation will still give us a very, very, very impressive number. And this number is still humanly impossible. And humanly impossible is literally the definition of the word miracle. And regarding what Ali Dahwa said in his famous clip that people keep sending to me over and over again, they are saying, see, there is a Muslim scholar that is saying that all of this stuff has been debunked. First of all, Ali Dawa is a brother that we all love and respect. And he never claimed to be a scholar. Did he ever say that? He is a recent revert from Christianity. He just joined Islam a couple of years ago. And he has a lot of positive energy that he uses to help others with the knowledge that he just acquired. That is not what we call a scholar. A scholar is someone who spent his whole life, 40, 50 years, drowning into Islamic books. Second of all, I already agreed with him on the fact that none of these pieces of evidence alone can be considered 100% proof in itself. Therefore, I would not call one of them alone a miracle. The miracle is the combination of all of them together. If you collect 100 or 200 together, if you watch the whole playlist from beginning to end, you will understand what I'm saying. Third of all, I don't know why he used the word debunked. Was this a cheap way to make a clickbait for more views on YouTube or was it simply a bad choice of words? I don't want to assume intentions or at least let's assume the correct intention. Maybe it was bad choice of words because what happened is Islamophobes quoted him using this word as if he meant miracles are completely fake and false. And there is a huge difference between saying they are completely false and between saying each one of them, if taken alone without the others, is not considered 100% proof, therefore we should not call it a miracle. And finally, for those people who are saying we should not judge the Quran by science because science is sometimes changing, or most of the time actually it is changing, yes, of course, you are right. This is why we avoid scientific theories altogether. 
We stick only with the established observations that are verifiable and observable. Go back to the playlist and watch it. You will find me avoiding all of the unverified theories. And as I keep saying from the beginning of the video, stop reading video titles, stop clinging to a word that some guy said somewhere. Go deep inside the content itself, listen to this and listen to that, and make sure you get the full meaning, you understand what they are trying to say, and then judge after you get the knowledge, not by clinging to a random word. Laziness to listen or read or looking for quick information is the highway for ignorance. Why did God make it hard for us to find him or to prove his existence? Why doesn't he just send us an undeniable sign and end this debate once and for all? I have watched all of your videos and I still have 1% doubt in my heart. If you're describing your faith in God with 99 out of 100 percentage, you know what? That is amazing. Allah said in Surah Al-Hijr, وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيكَ الْيَقِينَ Worship your Lord until certainty comes to you. The word certainty here refers to death. Allah also said in Surah Qaf, فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ In the hereafter, the veil that is over your eyes will be removed, and only then you will witness everything, only in the hereafter. In this life, this veil is preventing you from witnessing a lot of things. You can see angels, jinn, jannah, hellfire, and so on. So it is not the end of the world. If you say I have 99% faith and 1% doubt, it will increase over time, inshallah. Now I want to answer your question. Why doesn't Allah just send us an undeniable sign and end this debate? Allah already answered your question himself in Surah Al-An'aim. When people demanded an undeniable proof in the form of Allah sending an angel as a messenger instead of a human, he responded by saying, وَلَوْ جَعَلْنَاهُ مَلَكًا لَجَعَلْنَاهُ رَجُلًا وَلَا لَبَسْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ مَا يَلْبِسُونَ If we had sent an angel, we would make him look like a human. And they will still be in their confusion. What those people are asking is not proof. What those people are really asking for is not taking the test. They don't want to be living in a test of faith, i.e. dunya. They want to be treated like angels who have basically no choice but to worship Allah. Angels who have no choice but to obey. Angels who don't have free will. Think about it. Because angels have uninterrupted access to the truth. Because they don't have a veil that covers their eyes like us. They have to obey Allah 100% of the time. They don't have free will to choose to be good or bad. They don't have free will to choose to believe or not to believe. In other words, they don't have a test. But that also means, if you don't have a test, then there is no Jannah for you and there is no hellfire for you. Because no choice equals no punishment and equals no reward. Reward for what you didn't choose to believe and you didn't choose to obey. To us humans, Allah gave us the option to believe or not. Believe is part of the test of this life. If you choose willingly to believe, then you become better than angels and you get eternal paradise, which they don't get. And if you willingly choose not to believe, then you get punished by hellfire. That is the difference between us and them. So basically your question can be rephrased to be like this. Why can't we be just angels? But if by your question, you're not referring to completely losing our free will, you're just referring to a more easily accessible signs that do not require putting a lot of effort into reading or learning or watching six hours of videos. Yeah, some people actually got that. Like, for example, the followers of Moses, the followers of Saleh, the followers of Noah, peace and blessing be upon all of them. But ask yourself, what happened after they got the obvious undeniable sign? When the followers of Noah rejected, they drowned. When the followers of Lot rejected, they got immediately destroyed. And when the followers of Moses worshipped the golden calf, Allah told them what? The price of your repentance is death. If Allah provides an undeniable sign, he will immediately take away your second chances. Either obey or die. 
Imagine witnessing Moses turning a stick into a snake. Then all the plagues that we all know. Then splitting the sea in front of your eyes and you pass through it. And then a literal cloud moving above you providing you shade. And then food al manna was salwa coming to you from the sky, ready made, ready to be eaten. After all that, you go worship a golden calf. God's response to their sin was what? Very, very, very harsh. But look at you now. If you go now worship a statue of Virgin Mary, for example, will your liver immediately explode? No, it will not. You basically get millions of second chances. So maybe you will use one of them, one of all of these millions of second chances, to invest some time into reading and finding the truth about God. And when you invest time into learning, you will find out how obvious it was to begin with. You just were lazy to read. It is only not obvious for those who refuse to do their homework. So in a nutshell, having this barrier that you have to put effort or you get this 1% uncertainty, this is out of his mercy to you. So you will use it as an excuse for your very, very, very late repentance. Before I end this point, we really need to admit something. We need to admit that we are emotional beings. Our emotions overwhelm our logic in a lot of decision making. That applies to all of us. Don't say no, everyone except me. It applies to you. For example, if I tell you that there is a 90% chance that I have a deadly virus and there is a 10% chance that I don't have it. So 90% I have a virus, 10% I don't have it. And then I give you a choice. Would you rather shake my hand and hug me? Or would you rather me going to the doctor first to check on myself and then shake you my hand? What will be your choice? I am sure you will not take the chance. You will ask me to go check with the doctor first and then shake your hand. Now I will ask you the same question but in a different form. What if I tell you that you are 99% sure not 90, 99% sure that disbelievers will be in eternal hellfire. So logically, 99% chance is good enough for anyone to stay straight all of his life. But for some reason, when it comes to believing in God, logic goes bye-bye. They tell you, no, if it's not 100%, we will not believe. The difference is, in the virus example, you wanted to stay safe. So 90% was good enough for you. But when it comes to belief in God, you don't wanna. You don't wanna stop adultery. You don't wanna stop intoxicants. You don't wanna stop your haram money. This is why you claim that 99 is not good enough. The same people who cancelled all of their outings, stopped working, and stayed home for two years just because there was a chance that they might catch a virus. When you tell them now there is a chance that you might end up in hellfire, They refuse to pray for five minutes. The same girl who covered her face with a mask every day for two years just because there was a chance that she might get a virus, when you tell her to cover your hair, she becomes so arrogant and complains that there is not enough evidence for the existence of God. She gets terrified of the small chance that she might catch a virus, but she doesn't get terrified of the 99% chance to be in hellfire forever. They would rather claim that a simple Bedouin man called Muhammad, who could not read or write in the 7th century, was an expert in geology, meteorology, oceanology, physics, embryology, medicine, biology, psychology, botany, zoology, archaeology, and poetry. Not only that, he was also extremely, extremely lucky when he was guessing events from the past, events from his time, and events from the future and from the far future. And all his physical miracles that were reported by thousands of eyewitnesses and were verified are just lies. They would tell you, even if we combine all of that together, that would only give us 99.9999999% probability that he was a prophet. But you know, it's not 100%. We demand 100% proof. If there is no 100% proof that we're going to hellfire, we will not obey. Then the same people stay home for two years because of a much smaller chance that they might catch a virus. Desires murdered logic. 
What did the people who saw the moon splitting in front of their own eyes say? وَإِنْ يَرَوْا آيَةً يُعْرِضُوا وَيَقُولُوا سِحْرٌ مُسْتَمِرٌ When they saw the moon splitting, they claimed it can be magic. It is probably 99% a miracle, but 1% maybe it's a new form of magic that we never heard about. It's not 100%. They challenged the Prophet. We will never believe in you until you cause a spring to gush forth from the earth for us, or until you have a garden of palm trees and vineyards and cause rivers to flow abundantly in it, or cause the sky to fall upon us in pieces as you have claimed, or bring Allah and the angels before us face to face, or until you have a house of gold, or you fly into the heaven. And even then, we will still not believe in your ascension until you bring down for us a book that we can read. Say, Glory be to my Lord, am I not only a human messenger? Isn't that exactly like the atheists of today? Do we even need miracles to believe? Isn't it obvious that without God we wouldn't exist to begin with? Well, yes, of course, if you are on the fitra. If a person was not corrupted by school and by media indoctrination, sin normalization, corrupted made-up beliefs, and induced doubt in every aspect of life. People are different. For example, men like Abu Bakr or Ali ibn Abi Talib, they believed immediately when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, told them about God. Others believed because they were waiting for the Prophet anyway because of the prophecies in their books. Others believed after they saw the miracles and after they saw the moon splitting. Others believed after Islam prevailed. Some people are attracted to goodness, some people are attracted to proof, and some people are attracted to dominance. But what I'm sure of is that the first category, the people who are attracted to goodness, are the overwhelming majority. Before all of these modern discoveries that showed the intellectual superiority of the Quran and Hadith, billions and billions of people accepted Islam from all over the world. And all it took for them was to read the words of God and to understand the Sharia law. And the amount of goodness in it was enough proof that it was from the Creator. That does not mean that we have to force everyone to be like that. It is okay for some people to demand more evidence. It's not a crime. The idea of blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed, this is only in the Bible. We as Muslims, we say whoever demands logical proof, we can provide it for him. But whoever goodness is enough for him, we are okay with both. Are miracles enough for us to commit? If anyone does some supernatural actions, should we follow him? Absolutely not. We are waiting for the Dajjal, for example, who we know for a fact he can do supernatural stuff, but he is evil. Devils, jinns, and magicians also can do some stuff, but they are evil. Miracles are not the reason to believe. We demand three things to believe. Two of them are not enough. Number one. Who are you? Number two, what do you want? Number three, what is your proof? Let's go one by one. Number one, who are you? The one making the claim to be a prophet should be known to be a trustworthy person to begin with. Not a person looking for personal gain or looking for money or looking for dominance. He should not be a criminal. We would expect God to choose the best of the best to be a prophet and the role model for humanity. Number two, what do you want? If I follow you, what will you ask me? Will you ask me to do charity for the poor, for example? Or will you ask me to give you a percentage of my income, like what the church in the Middle Ages did? If you are asking me to give money to the poor, I will believe you. But if you are selling indulgement parchments, mm, I might doubt your intentions. Looks to me like a scam. Another example. If a man is claiming to be a prophet told me, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Like in the Bible 1 Samuel 15. I don't think that God or any of his prophets would ever, ever order the killing of innocent infants. Therefore, 
I need to make sure that he is asking for goodness first before I ask him to provide the proof. If we cover the first two, then we go to number three. What is your proof? Now we know for a fact that you are a moral person who is ordering only goodness. It is time to ask you for some supernatural proof to know that this message is from God himself. You didn't fabricate it on your own. Only then we would accept you as a prophet. If someone fulfills all of these three roles, he is an accepted prophet to us. If he fulfills only the miracles part, he might be a Dajjal. And because I know that there are a lot of non-Muslims watching these videos, and most likely their heads are filled with this Islamophobic propaganda that is spread on the internet about our perfect role model, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, I will make for you two more videos in this playlist. One of them will be about Muhammad himself as a man. Was he a trustworthy person? Was he moral or not? And what is more important is, did he benefit from the message personally or not? But I am sorry, I will read from the authentic sources, not from the Islamophobic lies you are used to listen to. And the second video will be a summary of the whole Sharia law. I will try to do it as fast as possible. I will try to briefly explain every part of the Sharia law in every category. So you can at least have a peek at what he's asking us to do. For now, I hope that I answered all of your questions. If I missed any of them, please write me in the comments. I will make sure to respond to them in the next video, inshallah. And if you reached this far in the video, first, I want to thank you for listening. And second, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, there are millions around the world who are in desperate need of the guidance of Allah to reach them. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, deliver my message, even if all you can deliver is one verse. It's your turn now. Like and comment to boost the video's reach and then share it on your social account. You can also download it and upload it to your channel. It's 100% copyright free. You don't even have to mention our name. Finally, if you missed our 200 pieces of evidence that will definitely prove that Islam is the truth, check out this playlist, Miracles of Islam. I am sure it will change your life forever. The link is in the description. Thanks and salam alaykum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد 
فاستجاب لهم ربهم أني لا أضيع عمل عامل منكم من ذكر أو أنثى بعضكم من بعض فالذين هاجروا وأخرجوا من ديارهم وأوذوا في سبيلي وقاتلوا وقتلوا وقاتلوا وقتلوا لأكفرن عنهم سيئاتهم ولأدخلنهم جنات ولأدخلنهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ثوابا من عند الله والله عنده حسن الثواب لا يغرنك تقلب الذين كفروا في البلاد متاع قليل ثم مأواهم جهنم وبئس المهاد لكن الذين اتقوا ربهم لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها خالدين فيها نزلا من عند الله وما عند الله خير للأبرار وإن من أهل الكتاب لمن يؤمن بالله وما أنزل إليكم وما أنزل إليهم خاشعين لله خاشعين لله لا يشترون بآيات الله ثمنا قليلا أولئك لهم أجرهم عند ربهم إن الله سريع الحساب يا أيها الذين آمنوا اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا واتقوا الله واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون